Electronic spirit. Do you have you ever seen one in the flesh? Uh, no. Have you ever been able to hold one of those in your hand? Negative. Yeah. Right behind his head on that shelf is one, just like what you're seeing. That is an air compressor assembly for one of these vehicles that we're talking about. Here. Very smooth, right? You got that? So the dryer, the release cap there. The release cap, if you look at the release cap, it's a little uh, orange ring. And when you push that orange ring, it releases that plastic airline, and you just pull it out of there. When you put it back in, you just shove it back in. This little compressor is cuter than all get out. If you look at one, it's a little piston. And it's for this uh, motor here, a world little crankshaft. It's got some bearings on it, and this little piston goes up and down in there, and it creates air pressure. Now, you've also got a vent solenoid that's built on there that's not really pictured very well in this uh, illustration, but it'll show later. But you notice you've got a regular electric motor down here that's operating all that. And sometimes you'll hear these things go, you know, when the car is raising back up and all that. All right, so this right here, we have air springs, we've got air shocks, we've got air spring and struts. And so there's a bunch of different things you do it. We're talking about steering and suspension. This is a particularly electronic steering and suspension is where we're going with this today. All right, so here you got your adjustable damping shocks and struts. There'll be a rotary actuator assembly on the top. And the way that works is it's got a little rod that comes down through here. And how many of you know how shock absorbers work anyway? What makes a shock absorber work? A plain old shock like the one you just took off of Mitchell's truck. Hydraulics. Huh? Well, it's it's you pushing it past something and then it's trying to get back with the spring and it can't because it's, it's going to have that fluid go around the sides. Yeah, basically you got a bunch of little orifices that this oil is going to go through, and the oil, and the oil is only going to go through there so fast. And so whenever it, it's pushing it through and having to come back, it's got a it's there's got a piston pushing the oil one way going through these little holes and the other way, and so it will go, but it's going to slow it down. And that's basically what it's doing. It's got a damping reaction. Once again, what is it like whenever your shocks are, how can you tell when shocks are bad? Push them down and they spring, spring, spring. If you boing, 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 what about, what else can you do? What if you're doing a visual inspection, how can you tell they're bad? The leaking. Yeah, they usually have all of them, right? Yes. Okay. Here's another thing. In all of your textbooks, you're going to hear that shocks don't hold the weight of the vehicle, but springs do. That's not exactly true on a lot of the, the uh, ones that's got McPherson strut those nitrogen charged shocks actually will, when you put them on a vehicle, raise the raise it up a little bit because of the nitrogen in there. Yeah. So those actually have a nitrogen capsule. Anyway, on this one here, imagine what we were just talking about. There's an actuator up here with a rod coming down here, and what that rod does, it's just able to turn back and forth. And it's able to stop up about half of those holes and make it harder for it to shock to move. And then it can, and that, so that's basically talking about firm or soft and all that. And so we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about how the uh, computer knows where that thing is. And anytime a computer is doing anything, it needs, it needs to be able to get feedback. And this is all computer controlled suspension. Now these damping shocks and struts have the same manner. The damping shock replaces the conventional shock absorber. It takes the place of the strut assembly. And you got some kind of mechanical valve assembly that enables switching between soft and hard. Basically what that's all about. Now why would you want hard suspension? Why would you want your suspension to be harder sometimes than others? Going off road. What about cornering? Mm -hmm. What about hard acceleration? You don't want the nose up in the front if it tightens it up, you know? And all that. All right. On some of them, you got a service switch that provides power to the own module. I've talked about this before several times. The own, the, it's in the trunk on Crown Victorias that have rear uh, air suspension. It's underneath the right side of the dash on expeditions, usually right by your foot. Make sure you know where that is. If it's got air suspension, don't put it on the lift and raise it up, or even try to jack it up and change a tire without turning off the air suspension. Because what happens is, especially if you're beside the road with a jack that's jacking up one corner and it gets confused and starts trying to change the load leveling, you know, you can do that. Now there is a way you can shut it down so that it won't make any height corrections without turning off the switch, but you'll see that in just a minute. When it's sent off, it will not respond to height sensor changes, and the air suspension indicator left will be illuminated. It'll actually say air suspension on there. All right, when the ignition, here's another input. When the ignition is switched to run, 
The air suspension module is active, lets the module make adjustments to the suspension as needed. I found that sometimes on some of these vehicles you have to open the door and close it before it will actually trigger and start working. Uh, on the earliest ones that I worked on back in the early 80s, we would put it in diagnostic mode by opening the door and closing it and doing things, and we would watch the light start flashing, and then it would throw codes by flashing the light at us. That was on the Lincolns. Uh, when the air, when the ignition switch is switched to the off position, the air suspension module will stay active for typically 30 to 60 minutes to perform limited leveling operations when weights added or removed from the vehicle. You load the uh, you know, like if you're a mafia guy and you're putting a big uh, fat guy in the trunk and then he squats it down and jacks it back up, see? So nobody will know you're hauling a body in the trunk, right? Okay. All right. Ride height sensors. This is how it knows what the height of the vehicle is. Now, this one right here, you got a front one and a rear one uh, pictured. Uh, but there, it depends on the type of electronic suspension system with which it's equipped. Uh, most of the ones that we see around are the ones that are just on the rear. Only the really high-end cars, like some of your Lincolns, will have it on all four wheels. Uh, they're analog or digital. What does that mean? What does analog or digital mean? They either got an on-off switch in them, or they got a switch that changes voltage with height. Got it? That's basically the way that works. And uh, those are there's an adjustment that can be made on them too. Now, on some of the Lincolns uh, that we had that I had worked on the uh, the Mark series Lincolns. Um, you can take your scan tool and you can plug it in and it's going to depend on you to tell it where the suspension is. Okay, so if you measure from the bottom of the wheel to the fender well and you put those numbers in there and then you tell it to do this automatic leveling, it recalibrates all that stuff and it levels it up like it's supposed to be. But you can lie to it and make it do crazy things. Like if you tell it it's one way or another, you can actually make it jack one corner up or go up and down, and you can fool it, you know, pretty well. Because all it knows is what you're telling it, and it's going to try to maintain that setting. It's sort of like a, a learning cycle that it goes through. So, but you're going to have it's going to be hooked to the part of the so the body and the suspension so that it will know what the ride height of the car. Is. Say you're doing an alignment check. Would you have to? Would it, would it come in counter with an alignment check at all? Oh, on those? Yeah. The only thing that you would want to do, uh, if I'm doing an alignment on one of those, I'm typically going to turn off the air suspension so I won't be jacking with it while I'm trying to get it set, you know. Uh, that's, the, that's my, you know, way of thinking about it anyway. The analog height sensor has got a continuous voltage signal that's just changing in relationship to vehicle height. Uh, and so, you know, digital height sensors basically have got on off signals at various different stages within their, uh, within their height. Digital height sensors have four wire electrical connector, power ground, signal A, and signal B. I've actually uh, created a little box when I was having to work on them doggone things that would light up some lights. You know, I would hook it up in there and it would light up lights whenever they were going through their little test procedure. And it would, I would see that A and B lighting up. Occasionally I'd find a bad part like that by looking at my little box with the lights on it. All right, the suspension control module uses the door ajar signal for system strategies such as preventing venting. Why, why would it do that? Why would they be concerned about it controlling, I mean, changing ride height whenever you got the door open? It shuts the thing down when you open the door. Imagine this. What if you lowered it, once you open the door and it lowered the door so it was sitting on a curb? <laughs> yeah. You couldn't close the door. Or sometimes you might have grass going up from the curb and it can damage the car and get it, fix it where you can't close the door. How many of you have ever opened a door out there against the, you know, the, where it was just above a grassy knoll that was going up? I'm not talking about the one with the rifleman. But you know, you sit down in the car and if you're a big heavy guy, it digs into the dirt. And then you're saying, crap, how am I going to get my door closed? You know, then you got to get somebody to drive off so the door will close. Or you get out of the vehicle and all of a sudden it's back up. Yeah, yeah exactly. But you got to get in and close the door. So that's the problem. Anyway, they don't want this happening. We've seen this before. We saw this last week, did we not? The vehicle speed signal can be supplied any number of ways based on the system. You've got to be able to familiarize yourself with the system. If you can read a wiring schematic, and you can reason, it's kind of like the air conditioner Moody was working on. Uh, you know, he didn't have no air conditioner and the guy had been fooling around with it and he basically had a wire harness that was laying on a hot pipe that had been laying there for a long time. First off, it started blowing fuses, eventually burned the wire in two and they couldn't even get the air conditioner to work. 
because whenever you turned on the air conditioner, it was supposed to go through that purple wire to pin 41 on the engine controller. So the engine controller would be able to turn on the air conditioner if the ground signal was present through the switches. And then it would actually have an output going to the relay coil. But it wasn't turning on the relay because it never saw that signal coming from pin 41 because that wire was in two before it burned in two on that SLV. That guy water. was impressed. And I told him how smart you were that you fixed all that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was laying all over that pipe, and if you see it laying on a pipe, did you fix it? Or would not lay on a pipe again? Yeah. All right, that was a good thing. All right. With this signal, you got steering wheel rotation. We saw this last week when we were talking about what system? ABS. The ABS system. Yep. With this signal, the control module determines the vehicle's turning rate and angle, and compares it with the vehicle's speed to gauge lateral acceleration. What's lateral acceleration? How fast am I going to the side? That's what lateral acceleration is. Think about the football player throwing the football to the side. That's lateral, right? Okay. Okay, you got it. The assistant theory, you're, going, you're actually going to make it firm when you're cornering, right? Okay, so if it's not firm when you're cornering, what's going to happen? You turn it over, or you're going to feel like you're going to turn over, or you're going to go, ooh, you know, that sort of thing. All right. The acceleration signal is provided by the PCM to the suspension control module to activate the suspension for the hard damping to reduce front end lift. Like when you're taking off, you're going to get some front end lift. Yeah? And if it does this instantaneously, it's going to mitigate that. Uh, it derives the signal from the throttle position sensor above 90% or the mass airflow sensor. If you go above 90% of your throttle position sensor, PCM's talking to this module and it says you better firm those shocks because this guy's taking off and he doesn't want his headlights pointing up in the trees while he's accelerating. Because we're not possible up here, right? Got it? All right. Brake signals. These switches right here can be very treacherous and leak fluid. And because they got a sealed connector, when they leak fluid, they can actually let fluid go into the wire harness and go to other connectors and cause all kinds of problems. And so, you know, I was talking about a transmission uh, that Jimmy worked on. It, but sometimes the transmission control, uh, the uh, overdrive line would come on by itself because brake fluid had punched its way through that sensor, gone all the way through the wire harness, got in the connector down there, and it with the brake fluid has got conductive properties to it, and it was shorting out some wires and sending a renegade signal to the transmission controller. And if you don't think that's hard to find, wow. when he unplugged it, brake fluid come out of the connector, and he knew where it came from. It had to come from here. When he pulled this off, it was all wet. But see, that's a sealed connector because it's under the hood. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll ride control systems. Brake sensor is a normally open pressure switch. It sends a hard braking signal to the control module. That particular one is different from the one I was talking about, but it has the same deal. I mean, it has the same propensity to leak. Uh, the cruise control switch is normally closed. This one's normally open. And you can also see a switch like this on the master cylinder, although this one here is actually they're showing it. What is this right here? What is that? What's that valve that's screwed up? That'd be probably a proportioning valve or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's the brake yeah. control. When the brake hydraulic pressure gets yeah. high enough, the brake sensor switch closes and the control module receives that. It'll switch it from soft to hard to prevent vehicle nose dive or rear end lift. Hey, I don't really like nose dives or rear end lift on my vehicle. Okay, so we're going to dampen them. You know, stop that. Yeah. All right. All right. Now you got personality select switches. How many people in here have personality? All of you guys got personality. You're going to want your switch, you're going to want it set a certain way. Most of the people are really just not paying attention to it. But that lets the driver select between ride control strategies. The strategy selections may include plush, normal, firm, change allows the control module to change shock. If you want it to change to a certain feel, you can actually punch those buttons and do that. You know, this really it looks to me like stuff that probably ought to be in a sales brochure. But basically, you need to know it's there because what happens if you've got a shorted wire or a bad switch and it's always in soft and you're throwing a code? Or Maybe you're not throwing a code. You got to be able to tell. Look at your, if you can look at it with your scan tool. This switch allows the driver to manually select hard shop damping. You know, some of these diehard, you know, gear dudes, they want it to be hard all the time. All right, some four wheel drive vehicle to drive control use the 4x4 four four mode switch as an input. And it changes it to half, uh, soft to hard ride when a vehicle's in 4x4 four four mode. You don't want your springs being boing, boing, boing whenever you're bouncing over, you know, stuff and all. Some four-wheel air suspension system will increase ride vehicle height uh, to an off-road height when the mode switches in 4 before. How many of you have seen the commercial that Ford had uh, about this Lincoln? And 
they would drive this Lincoln up to, uh, there was a little, it was a Mark 8, I guess, or whatever it was, and they'd drive it up, there was a concrete barrier, and the guy would drive up here, and he would just stop about the time the top of the car touched that concrete barrier, Deek. and then he would back up, and he would go down the track, and he would come back driving toward that concrete barrier at 70 miles an hour, and he would go under it. Huh. Because the air suspension, when you get to go at a certain speed, yeah, it lowers the car wow. an inch. <laughs> yeah, but it was really cool to watch because you just know he's going to take the top off of that car because he just touched it, you know. And then when he comes back, there's a commercial, you can probably find it on YouTube, there's a commercial where you see that and that guy's coming just blickety split toward that thing and he goes under it and doesn't even touch the top of the car. Yeah, don't try this at home. Okay? I was going to say that that takes a lot of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's momentum. All right, so let's see here. Let's get it for you. All right, let me see. Not applicable. Look at that. I got something going on here. Okay, you got well, the way that these things work on your shock absorber actuator position feedback. There's a motor over there. That little motor on top of the shock I was talking about. And there's a feedback signal in there. And I basically built a little thing with a rocker switch on it. A little indicator light, so I could, and I got a little connector that we would plug in, and I plug it in, and I could drive that thing back and forth, and see if it would, if the indicator signal worked, and if it was working the shock and all that. If you take the actuator off the top of the shock and you try to turn it with some pliers, it'll turn pretty easy. If it don't, then the shock's bad; it's going to be replaced. So that's not really all that complicated. The circuit's open or closed, depending on whether it's in hard or soft mode. So yeah. you got a ground feedback signal. There's a voltage going out there that's coming through a current limiting resistor. Whenever the motor actually is, you know, changes positions, it goes, and so this is a feedback, so it'll know where it's at, so it'll know what to do. Uh, when it matches the commanded state of the damper, the corresponding damper motor driver is turned off. Well, if that's the way it does, it doesn't need to keep trying to move it, right? On other systems, without a direct feedback, it reads the actuator circuit to determine what position the actuator is in. All right, we got that. On ride control system with reverse actuator, suspension control module, controls hard soft ride. Does this look like a familiar circuit? Have you, have you, you people that have been in electrical seen that kind of circuit before? Yes, that looks like. You have. Oh, it's not It's, it's like the whirling light. You know, you've got a couple of relays here, and basically your module is basically going to operate the, each relay, and whenever it changes position, only on one of them, it'll drive the motor that way. And then obviously you got a little feedback circuit down there. See, so it can be complicated or it can be simple, depending on how they go about it. Two wire actuators and on off solenoid. If the solenoid's off, the shock's in hard damping. When the solenoid's on, the shock's in soft damping. And it's integral with the shock absorber. And you cannot back separately. The other ones you can. Okay, the two wire actuator is uh, a pretty cool little deal. Three wire actuator is a DC motor in the top of the shock. Real quick, we saw that a minute ago. Same thing. Uh, it's an integral with the shock. It says it's not serviceable separately, but I've actually took them off of shocks and put them in my toolbox. And you can get it off, it's just got little Torx bits. And when you pull it off, the little connectors, I mean the little place where it connects to that rod going out of the shock's a double D. You know what a double D is? Flat on two sides, round on two sides, that's a double D. You've seen that, like top of a shock okay. absorber. You don't know that's a double D. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got that. All right, air compressor relay. The compressor relay controls power to the compressor motor. It's needed because the air suspension control module cannot directly supply current needed to power the air compressor. You got that? The compressor relay switches side current loads to the compressor. That's what every relay does. Basically, you want a little wire to be able to control a big circuit. It takes the load off the switch. Yeah, it's a low current signal for the control module. Some systems use a solid state relay, while others use a conventional mechanical relay. Okay, air spring solenoids are installed into the air springs. I've usually got one of those laying up here somewhere. Uh, this is an air spring solenoid right here. See this? That's what they look like in the real world. Uh, the coolest way about seeing if you've got one that's leaking down, you can pull those air springs off really easy. You can air them up and you can put them under water. If you see bubbles, they need new air springs. What we usually do, well, if the car is very old, we buy a $300 kit or a $280 kit or whatever it is. It, get, it comes with shocks and springs to convert it to regular coil spring suspension. Mm -hmm. Doesn't cost that much to do. Have you seen some that were flat? You know, the, the springs are flat and people are driving around with the thing <laughs> hunkering down in the back. But now uh, we've had that Lincoln, you know. Uh, there was a guy that came over there on a, on a uh, Lincoln, a Mark 7, and uh, he was a big muscled up guy, looked like uh, Carl Weathers or somebody. Anyway, he had this Lincoln, and I said that at the time I couldn't do anything with it because we were swamped. And some of the air compressors will have an air chuck 
on the uh, compressor. And yeah, and what happened is if that air compressor is running and it can't pump them up because the air compressor wear out, they cost about three hundred fifty dollars, or they used to. You could actually put an air chuck on there like you would do tires, you know, right there at the air compressor. They won't all have it. That one don't got it, but some of them do. And you can actually air it up with an air compressor, mm -hmm. you know, with with an air hose. And then we and I aired his up and let him drive off like that. Anyway, uh, the solenoid is energized to allow air to be added to or vented from the air spring. Now, at least this is like that little white one I showed you. That one there is hardwired to ground and power comes from the module. So remember which way that goes. Don't remove the solenoid without removing air pressure from the spring because it could blow out of there. Like that. Okay, they're electronically operated and controlled by the module and they're secured with a clip and a twist lock. It's not even hard to take them out of there. Right. The gate solenoid provides air pressure isolation to the left or right air shocks. That's if you're only going to level one corner. Now the ones that do the back, it levels both of the back ones at the same time. But as far as the, the fancy ones, it's got all the four corners. You got gate solenoids to separate them so that there's no way, you know, if it's not just raising or lowering the whole car. Okay. If you let transfer between uh, shocks, reduce the resistance of wheel movement, you got to smooth it right there. But anyway, the gate solenoids off and air pressure is held. Going to reduce body rule. That's another thing he does. Okay, so get your fill solenoids. They connect the output of the compressor to the spring shocks or struts. And these, this one and the one before, it's talking about four wheel uh, air suspension. The fill solenoids are electronically operated and controlled by the module. Fill solenoids for air springs are integrated into the air spring and they're in the air line and separate from the shock. Okay, right here we got a dryer vent solenoid. This is another view. So you can tell this is what we're looking at up there. Same deal. Uh, it lets air escape from the system. This, if it wants to let, in other words, if you take this line loose from that little dryer, then that air is going to come out of those springs and it's going to go flat. But the, in order to make that happen, you're going to have to energize the spring at the top of the compressor. I mean, the top of, excuse me, the solenoid, the, valve at the spring itself because it's going to keep solenoid air uh, air trapped in the spring. I'm stumbling over my words. Okay, vent solenoid opens along with air solenoid when the control module determines vehicle lowering is needed if it's too high. Right? Now some people used to say, you know, if you jack the car up without turning off the air suspension, it'll fill the bags up and it'll try to bust them or something like that. What it does actually is, you see the car that's too high and it's all the air out and you let it down, you can't get the lift out from under it. It's very embarrassing. They'll laugh you out of a shop like that if you're working in the shop. And I had it happen to me a few times. Oh, I didn't usually work on a lift, but if you, I've actually had jacked it up with a jack, and then when I let it down, it come down on the jack, and I couldn't get the jack out of the lift. People with the other mechanics go, whoa! <laughs> yeah, they're laughing at you. So, all right, air suspension warning indicator lamp is usually located on the instrument cluster. You've seen these. Check air suspension. My dad's uh, 2001 Marquee has got this check air suspension uh, lamp on the dash. And then you got some of them have a firm ride control lamp, and that may flash if a failure is detected. Some of them may use the system status indicators, and so on and so forth. Okay, the diagnostic connectors are only used during diagnosis and testing. Electronic suspension systems that are on a network will use the OBD2 connector. Uh, located under the dash, non-network systems will not use the OBD2, but will use the one dedicated for electronic suspension control. All right, what else does the electronic suspension control handle if, like if it's got electronic suspension, you and I worked on one, you know this connector back here in the trunk? What were we working on when we were fooling with the connector in the trunk? No, it wasn't the steering. The steering, so it's going to be built together with that module. You see what I mean on the ones that have it. Uh, control module, microprocessor based, and it controls the air compressor motor through the compressor relay and also it's going to take inputs, it's going to give outputs, it's going to make things happen. Really, the most complicated electronic module that we've got is the first one they put on the car, which was the engine control module. All the rest of them are fairly simple. If you can understand the engine control module, it's, it's going to be clear sailing on that one. Uh, how the module is diagnosed and what test equipment must be used is basically the big deal over here. Rear load leveling suspension, this is just a quick rundown on that. We're almost through here. Inputs, control module, compressor assembly. You see these? That's a compressor assembly up there. You notice it's got a little crankshaft for the piston and all that. Vent solenoids number four. Air solenoids are down here. You see this basic schematic of how this is supposed to work. This is an engineering drawing of it. 
and uh, make it probably turn into a skeleton back there. Okay, and this one right here, if I can get it to change, control module commands the, commands the relay to turn on, solenoids open, looks at the ride height, turns them off, the seal air in the spring, commands the compressor relay to turn off the compressor when it needs to be lowered, it opens the vent solenoid, commands the air spring to open, lowers the great ride height, commands the air springs off, and it controls the commands of the vent solenoid off. So it goes to the system. This is a four, four way uh, or leveling here. See that? There's your module. There, there will be a pop test on this, and all these will be empty, and you'll have to fill in those whenever, uh, probably be part right before your final event. Done. Will that be good? All right. Mesmerize those. Can you do that, can you? You can figure it out. Yes. Although it would be hard to tell which air spring was which, looking yeah. at this. Left, front, right, rear, and all that. You know, how can you tell? Whatever. All right. So, everybody happy about that? Ride control layout. This is what it looks like on the car. Does that, that doesn't even look complicated, does it? You could probably just look at that and figure it all out. Got it? Basically, it's just giving you an overview of that. And that's the end of the slideshow. You want to help me with that? Excuse me? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's, let's get around here. Let's point the camera a different way. And let's uh, run over our test to make sure that we, don't, we didn't miss anything. Uh, number one, the control module on four-wheel drive vehicle with ride control switches the shocks from firm to soft when four-wheel drive is engaged. False. 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 It doesn't, it switches them from soft to firm, doesn't it? That was a little word game we played there. Under what two conditions does the air suspension warning indicator usually come on? When it shuts off or it's a malfunction. They're very good, Steve. That's, right. That's a good answer. Uh, the air suspension control module strategy is to do what? Why is air suspension on there, you all? Why do we even have air suspension? Air suspension. Control the ride. Huh? Very good. It's fried hat correction. That's what it's for. That's the answer I was looking for. All right. Okay. What controls power to the compressor motor? Compressor relay. I saw some people writing answers when we got there. The acceleration signal is provided to the electronic suspension module by which other module? Throttle position sensor. Well, that's not a module. That's actually an input. PCM. PCM. Engine controller. Figure that out. Technician A says damping shocks and struts operate in the same manner. Technician B says damping shocks and struts operate differently. B. That's actually uh, A there. You know. They're basically going to, as far as the actual shocks and struts, they're going to operate the same way. Um, you know, there's some differences in the way that they're controlled, but the operation of them is the same. They're basically going to either damp or not damp. Uh, or damp more or less. Technician A says air suspension system dryer is a regular maintenance item. Technician B says air passes back through the dryer during venting. B. That's B actually. Uh, the acceleration signal is provided by the PCM to the suspension control module to activate the suspension to do what? Huh? <coughs> make it, make, do, do what? <laughs> Make it firm. firm, okay. I thought you said it was, it said some use the word burn. I was trying to figure that out. Uh, and that's basically going to make it uh, from, is, why does it want to do that? Yeah, if you have acceleration signal though, if I'm standing on it, stroker, where are we going to go? So you don't nose up, that's right, front end lift. Some air suspension systems use what input for height adjustment and kneel strategies? You remember what I was describing earlier where the Lincoln's going, going under the, the wall? That's a kneel strategy, kneel. After, you know, when you're driving faster, it goes lower. It'll give you a little better air. But incidentally, did you know the 2015 uh, F-Series pickup's going to have an all-aluminum body? <laughs> what? Yeah, 700 pounds lighter helps with fuel economy. Wow. They're riveted together. Okay. All right, so... Uh, I don't know where I came up with it. All right. <laughs> I read about that a couple of days ago. When the two-wire actuator is blank, the shock is in hard damping mode. That's on page 4-15 of your handout now. 
<laughs> you know, you don't have a handout. Bobby was looking confused. Okay, all right. That's basically it's off. When the two wire actuator is off, the shock is in hard damping mode. Oh, yeah.